What's good students, it's your boy Mr. Stevenson. In these videos we're talking about the new set works for the edXL GCSC and in today's video we are going to talk about music for a while from Hen Henry Purcell. Uh, a little bit of background on uh, Purcell himself. Uh, he was alive from 1659 to 1695. This is the Baroque era and he worked under a system of patronage which means that uh, wealthy types would pay him to write music for them, uh, including the royal family of the time. He was also the church organist at Westminster Abbey, and uh, he done most of his musical composing in the Reformation period. Uh, the Reformation uh, was uh, a kind of a big change in the traditions of the English Protestant, Protestant church. Uh, and a huge, huge change in the musical traditions occurred at, the t at that time as well, including, uh, for once, uh, the English Protestant Church were embracing music uh, from all over Europe, and church, church music began to become much more interesting, and to be composed, for instance, with, uh, with an orchestra. Also, operas became hugely popular uh, in the United Kingdom as well. Uh, Henry Purcell, really capitalized on this and created some amazing stuff, including this particular piece, Music for a While, uh, which is the second of, fourth move, of four movements, rather, uh, of incidental music. Incidental music is uh, music that forms part of the story. Um, so music that occurs within a story in a play, rather than the theme from the start to the end. Music that occurs within the, the play and kind of drives along the dialogue. It's the second of four movements of incidental music from the play Oedipus by John Dryden and Nathaniel Lee. Oedipus is uh, based on the Greek legend of the same name uh, about a little fella who is abandoned as a child. Um, he comes back to his place of birth as an adult and he, uh, he kills his dad without realising it. He kills his dad and marries his mum. Gross. Uh, when he realises what he did, he picks his little eyes out. Gross. And uh, he commits suicide. Damn. And uh, this particular piece of music from Purcell, uh, the lyrics, they drive along the storyline of the play. Uh, in this particular scene, the soloist sings to a goddess, or uh, as they are called in Greek tradition, a fury named Alecto, who is able to, and I quote from the lyrics, free the dead from their eternal bands, or to uh, to bring the dead, bring spirits back to uh, the real world, so she can communicate with them. Uh, and the soloist is singing to Alecto in order to beguile, that is in the, in the term that's in the lyrics, to beguile or to bewitch her or to confound her, put her under a spell if you like, uh, to, and I should have said this before, uh, she has snakes for hair, guys, she has snakes for hair, um, and she carries a whip around as well, not really, you know, nicest, nicest of characters. Um, so the soloist is singing to her, in order to beguile her, to make the snakes fall from her head and the whip from her hands. Again, I'm quoting directly from the lyrics. Uh, the reason uh, the soloist is singing to Alecto is so that Alecto will summon the ghost of King Laius, that is Oedipus' father, uh, to find out who was his murderer. Uh, the song itself is a lament. Um, a lament is, uh, in essence, a sad song filled with longing uh, from this era. Uh, features of a lament that, uh, that, are, that are used in this particular piece are a sorrowful narrative. Uh, you, will, you will get that from the lyrics. A minor key and a slow tempo. Uh, you would maybe refer to... Uh, a uh, piece of music like this is maybe a dirge or you know, a, something a bit dreary. 
key, key word to remember for that is that it is a lament. And it is in stile italiano, or the Italian style. Uh, it is a concertato, uh, which is a term from early Baroque music that refers to either a genre or style of music in which groups of instruments or voices share a melody, uh, usually in alternation, so they will, uh, the instruments or voices will switch uh, who is taking the melody. And it's almost always over a basso continuo. I will get to that in a minute. Uh, it is a dramatic recitative, which is also a feature of the Stile Italiano. Uh, a dramatic recitative is, uh, well, let's break that down. Dramatic, we know uh, to mean that it is from a drama. It's recitative, and the lyrics carry uh, the narrative or the dialogue of the play. Uh, it is a de capo aria also. Um, an aria is simply a sung work from an opera. Uh, de capo uh, means from the head. Uh, capo in Italian means head. We can tell it is a de capo aria because after the B section it goes back to the head or the start of the song. Uh, the lines beginning with music for a while. Uh, that occurs at the very at the very start or the head of the song and at the very end, so it goes back to the head. And it uses a basso continuo, also known as a ground bass. These are often variations on a theme, where a theme is played and uh, varied in different ways, perhaps by different instruments or by using ornamentation. We'll get to that as well. But it's music that is written over a pattern of repeating bass notes. The modern term we would use is a bass line. Um, the harpsichord carries the bass line, bass, uh, the uh, basso continuo in the left hand. And it's a bit unusual, this basso continuo. The patterns are normally four bars long, the uh, basso continuo patterns. This one is three bars in length. Uh, if you have a listen to the piece to play it now, uh, you should be able to get that. The best known uh, basso continuum piece, perhaps, is Packlebell's Canon. Uh, Canon in D. Uh, you, may have, you will have heard that one before at every wedding ever. Uh, and there are several other very famous basso continual pieces that you can check out, um, including lots by uh, fantastic composer Handel. Instruments wise, uh, there is a vocal, uh, which is a, in the soprano range, uh, would also be referred to in the Baroque era as a countertenor. Uh, soprano range, however, is C4. A5. On their knees. Uh, harpsichord. Uh, we should know what harpsichord is. It is similar to a piano, uh, but rather than the strings being hit with hammers, they are plucked uh, when a key is depressed. Uh, so with harpsichords, uh, it is not really possible to play at different volumes. So everything is kind of at a constant volume. With a piano you can play harder or softer, and hammer will hit harder or softer. Uh, with a harpsichord, no matter what strength you hit a key, it's always going to be picked. So, uh, a bass viol, which is a predecessor to the modern violin, and a lute, a very early stringed instrument, uh, played in a similar way to a guitar. On the uh, score for this piece of music, as is tradition with almost all Baroque music, dynamics are not written, nor are uh, tempo dimensions. But we can tell from listening to it that it is at a fairly constant low dynamic. Uh, again, that is to do with the limited dynamic range of the Baroque instruments. And tempo-wise, it is pretty slow. Uh, we 
would probably use the term, uh, we would probably call it Andante. The pitch of this piece, or the key, is written as A minor. However, the actual pitch using today's standards is in fact a semitone lower than that. And it's actually in G sharp. Uh, this is because it was made using Baroque instruments that were tuned to Baroque pitch. Uh, the, st the pitch standards in the Baroque era were different to what they are now. Our current pitch standards are that middle A is 440 hertz. Uh, hertz being the amount of peaks and troughs per second in the sound wave. And everything else is in relation to that. In Baroque music, middle A is 415 hertz. It wasn't up until the end of the Baroque era that A being 440 was established as the global standard, and it has not changed since then. Uh, the structure of it is ternary form, uh, the, which is A section, B section, A section. The repeated A section is considerably shorter than the first, uh, so it will be hitherto referred to as the A1 section. You could also refer to this as rounded binary form in that it is a b and then a very very short a section uh, so uh, let's break that down the intro is bars one to three section a is bars four to twenty one section b bars twenty two to twenty eight and the a one section twenty nine to thirty eight you can tell the B section by its key change. It very clearly changes to a major key. You should be able to hear that happening right now. There we go. Uh, there is a lot of use ornaments in this piece of music, as with any uh, type of Baroque music. Baroque music is always very kind of heavily uh, decorated and rather than playing a straightforward melody more often than not, especially harpsichord players, will kind of dance around the melody and ornament it somehow. Um, the ornaments we hear in this are upper and lower mordants, uh, which is a quick switch to the note above or below and back. Um, so for instance, let's say an upper mordant uh, on A was written on a score, so you would play this. Or if a lower mordant on A again was written on a score, you would play this. Good. We have also got an appoggiatura ornament. Uh, sorry about that uh, little Italian accent there. Um, an appoggiatura is a note that leans in on the main note, taking half its value. Uh, you will see one on a, on a score on the screen now. These are normally either a tone or a semitone higher than the main note. I will play a melody with an appoggiatura. And uh, sorry, without an appoggiatura first, and then with to begin with. So you can hear that happening. The word setting is mostly a uh, syllabic which means that each syllable from each word has its own note and it doesn't go up or down on that note, it stays on that note. Um, there are some uses of melisma uh, throughout the piece, uh, which you can find. Uh, melisma is when a word uh, shifts across multiple pitches. So a, word, a syllable is stretched and the pitch will go up and down. 
A good example of this is on the word eternity. Uh, sorry, eternal. Eternal, not eternity. Eternal. Uh, in the B section. You should be hearing that now. As well as being an example of melisma within the piece, the word eternal is also an example of word painting within the piece as well. Uh, word painting is when a word is performed in such a way that reflects its meaning. Uh, so the word eternal, for instance, is dragged out across a very, very long time, thereby reflecting its meaning of you know, going on for a long time. Other examples of word painting in this one are the word drop. Very simple. It drops in pitch when it is sung. Uh, you should be hearing that now. And a third example of word painting from the piece is the word wandering. When this word is sung, the singer wanders around on the pitch. Very simple. Uh, so that is some use of word painting. See if you can find any more, give it a listen, see if you can find anything else that you think kind of fits into that description. To add to the drama within the piece, there is some use of dissonant intervals. A dissonant interval is a combination of notes that can be considered uncomfortable or clashing. Um, a great example of this is the word pains at bar 12 beat you should be hearing that now. So in uh, what's going on there, the vocalist is singing an E note, and it is over a D minor chord, which contains an F note. Now if you have a look at the pian piano here, you will see that E and F are direct neighbours. Uh, they are a semitone apart. If I play them together, it is going to sound very, very ugly and dissonant. Check this out. Dissonance is also achieved uh, in this piece from the use of suspensions. Uh, suspensions are when a note is hung on or sustained uh, from a section where it isn't where it fits in musically to a section where it doesn't. So it creates a kind of a momentary uh, fleeting instance of dissonance and discomfort. And the, this really adds to the kind of the, the drama of the piece. Another interesting uh, technique in terms of pitch that is used in this one is a tierce de picardie on the word snake. A tierce de picardie is a section in a minor key ending with the root chord of that key for its major equivalent. So for instance, the A section is in A minor and the first chord of the B section is an A major, which really adds to the drama of that section. So it's a sharpened third from, from minor to major. Uh, so the chord changes from being A, C, E to A, C sharp, E. It really gives a sense of drama on its arrival. Have a practice of that. If you know any pieces that you can play on your instrument, they're in a minor key. Just practice ending them on the home chord for its major equivalent. It can give a real nice sense of drama. Uh, the piece ends on an arpeggiated final chord. That is when a pattern is made from picking out each of the chord, each of the notes in the chord, one after the other. You should be hearing that now. Okay, great. And I think that's all I want to talk about on this particular set work. Uh, it's obviously going to be really helpful for you guys to do a bit of your own research. As usual, contact me you want any more information or if I've got anything wrong either through here or my email address will be on the screen now.
and happy revising. Don't forget to look for some exam questions on this one and all of the others. Great stuff. See you later then. Bye bye.